And we begin with late breaking news on the south side. Police say a woman was slashed in the throat. Police say friends were gathered at a home on Ludkey Avenue when a man said that he needed a ride home. A woman believed to be in her 50s offered him that ride. And during that trip, police say they allegedly got into some kind of argument leading him to slice her throat, though it's unclear with what. She tells police the man then took off on foot and she drove back to that home where someone called 911. Police say her injury may be life threatening and she was taken to a hospital. That suspect is still on the loose. The city and the San Antonio Police Officers Association still disagreeing on officer discipline, but the union hasn't ruled out the possibility of finalizing a new contract with the city before the May 1st election. And doing so would lock in the terms for five years, no matter what voters decide on Proposition B. That's that May 1st ballot measure, which could strip the union of its collective bargaining power and stop any ongoing contract talks in their tracks. But how likely is a pre-election deal to happen? Our Garrett Berger brings us the latest. The idea that you come back to the city's proposal is, you know, effectively that we never lose again is just is is dishonest. The city's top priority, the scope of the appeals process for fired cops, remains the biggest bone of contention in the police contract talks. As the city looks for a way to avoid having the chief's discipline overturned on appeal, and the union tries to ensure its members can still effectively challenge what they believe to be unjustified firings. I'm not offended by the word dishonest. I would use disingenuous for you because that is exactly what your position is, whether you state it or don't state it. Now, the city and union have discussed common ground, but haven't come up with a compromise yet. So the two sides agreed today to discuss discipline issues behind closed doors in a subcommittee before bringing things back to the negotiating table. I think it comes down to only about three sections out of both of those articles where we're having some disagreement. But it's not only discipline that's still up in the air. Big issues like pay and health care, the foundation of any labor deal, haven't been sorted out either. The head of the union's bargaining committee won't rule out a pre-election deal, though he says if it happens, it would be tight. Don't ever put solid lines in the ground because I've seen things change. And the city team continues to avoid committing to any abbreviated timeline. As we um, schedule meetings till April 19, so we will continue to bargain um, uh, consistent with those dates. But a pre-election police contract won't just depend on these negotiating teams. The city council and the union membership need to ratify a deal, too. Yeah, Garrett, would council even take this up before voters make a decision on Prop 1, which comes on May 1st? Well, it's kind of a tough question. I talked with all of the council members or members of their offices in the past two days, and while I didn't get a lot of straight answers, it did sound possible that depending on the terms of the deal, a majority of the council could be open to voting on a contract. Though we did get more than one who commented that looks like that's a bit of a long shot of happening at this point anyhow. In the newsroom, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12. All right, thanks, Garrett. We have learned many of the unaccompanied minors arriving at the border could be housed at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland. The Defense Department has contacted both Lackland and Fort Bliss in El Paso at the request of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. No word yet on a decision. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is planning to bring back the Central American Minors Program so they could be processed before coming to the U.S. Another program would give refugee status to migrants escaping persecution. Both would be based in their home countries to try to reduce the flow of migrants arriving at the border. Once this kind of backlog of people who have been pushed back for so long gets worked through, I think the numbers are going to go down and be more manageable. Schumer says many of the unaccompanied minors crossing the border had family with them, especially the youngest ones. But realizing that their children would have a better chance of being allowed to enter the U.S., she says many parents make the difficult decision to let their children go alone to join family members in the U.S. The idea is to close the digital divide. Harlandale ISD partnering with the city of San Antonio to soon bring Internet to hundreds of students by installing towers around the community. Tiffany Huertas has more on this new project and how it could impact students in Harlandale. I have been in this district for almost 25 years, and we have been fighting the digital divide from year one. Myrna Martinez, the Information Services Director at Harlandale ISD, is excited about a new project that will help students learning remotely. Through a partnership with the City of San Antonio, towers will be placed around the community to provide fast-speed internet for students. 
through the Connected Beyond the Classroom initiative that the city um, it is, is, is managing. Um, we get six towers in and around in, in the district. Families living near the towers will receive a router where they can connect to the internet. The way those sites were selected, it was part of the, the research that UTSA and the city of San Antonio did. Um, you know, it was based on, on population density and of course the economic need. Martinez says about 90% of the students in the district are economically disadvantaged. Currently, about 75% of Harlandale ISD students are still learning remotely. I think it's a good investment uh, for now, for the future of our kids. I mean, just never know. We have to go back remote. At least we know that there's an access for our kids to be able to get online and not struggle. Martina says the goal is to have the towers operational and home routers distributed by the start of the fall semester. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. They have their own jobs and their own families, but they're taking extra time to share the hospitality of San Antonio. A group of unpaid volunteers is assigned to every NCAA women's basketball team in town, bringing them food and supplies while the teams adhere to strict COVID-19 protocols. Courtney Friedman introduces us to some of these local helpers. It's not her day job, but since Thursday, Kristen Touring has become an expert delivery worker. I've made deliveries from the Cheesecake Factory, Zoe's Kitchen, um, Smoothie King. We had a couple Smoothie King runs, um, coffee, taking about like four or five hours out of the day. She's one of around 100 local unpaid volunteers working with each of the NCAA women's basketball teams staying in San Antonio for the big tournament. Strict COVID protocols require teams to stay in the hotels unless they're practicing or playing. That's where virtual host volunteers like Letty Gonzalez come in, who dropped off cookie cab to North Carolina's team today. They drop the bags onto the table outside the hotel, and the team staff members come grab the items and bring them to the players or coaches. We've also gotten some fun requests for cascarones, cowboy hats. One of the coaches, he broke his glasses, and we had a virtual team host pick up glasses from lens crafters for him so he was able to see and continue practicing. Touring is working for Stanford's team which has an exciting local connection. I work for New Star Energy and one of my coworkers, her, his daughter is Kiana Williams. Williams is a star player who graduated from Wagner High School right here in San Antonio. And it's been awesome. It's been kind of a full circle story to see her come back. That genuine enthusiasm showing visitors that San Antonio's warmth and hospitality is always a slam dunk. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. An update now to a high speed chase, which led to a deadly crash over the weekend. The Bear County Medical Examiner identifying the victim in this case as 50 year old Cynthia Ann Demps. According to the Bear County Sheriff's Office, it all started when 19 year old Esteban Zamaripa III was spotted driving recklessly on Terrasso Drive. This was Sunday morning about 1, 1 a.m. Deputies say Zamaripa hit several curbs, refused to stop for police. He later started driving the wrong way, leading him to crash into a semi truck and another car near Ritterman and Frat. Demps behind the wheel of that other car. She died at the scene. Zamaripa facing a murder charge and evading vehicle charges. San Antonio police arresting a man in connection with a theft of thousands of dollars worth of car parts from a Southside dealership. 36 year old Roland Ramirez was taken into custody yesterday. He's accused of stealing catalytic converters and damaging vehicles at South Point Automotive. According to an arrest warrant, Ramirez went to the dealership on two separate days back in December. On the first, he allegedly took parts from eight vehicles. On the second visit, he was arrested there on the spot. Police say Ramirez later confessed. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, about one in five adults has had to provide unpaid health or supportive care to someone they love. Social distancing and other safety practices have further isolated caregivers who already tend to feel overwhelmed and alone. Ursula Perry with how to find the patience, the time and the energy to be a good caregiver. An aging parent, a sick spouse, or a child with a disability. Caregiving comes in different forms, and it can be both rewarding but stressful, too. More than 65 million Americans provide care for a family member or a friend during any given year, and the COVID pandemic has no doubt increased that number tremendously. So what makes a good caregiver? The first step is to take care of yourself. 
Make sure you get plenty of rest, eat a well-balanced diet, and don't skip your own medical appointments. Also, delegate responsibilities. For instance, if you're managing and providing day-to-day -day care, maybe another family member can manage the finances or maybe the medications. When possible, let the person being cared for participate in decision-making. Support groups are another great resource to help you connect with other caregivers. And recognize when it all becomes too much. You may want to consider an assisted living or another type of facility for your loved one. About 40% of caregivers end up having to quit their jobs in order to stay at home and take care of their loved one. And in the case of COVID, that can be a long-term commitment because symptoms can last for long haulers. And if that's the case, then that's two potential wage earners who are off the payroll and can't take care of the house. It's a big commitment. Ursula Perry, Case at 12 News. Just about time for the daily briefing and the big news today on COVID-19. Starting on Monday, every adult in Texas will be eligible for the vaccine. Very exciting news, of course, being eligible and being able to find a vaccine. Two different things. Let's go to City Hall for today's COVID-19 update. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 133 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 202,000. 849 with the seven day rolling average now at 168. Unfortunately, today we have two new deaths to report tonight from COVID-19. Uh, we've now lost a total of 3,073 of our neighbors, friends and family members to COVID. And so again, please remember that each one of these uh, numbers, an illness or death is a loved one who is um, missed and uh, who we're grieving over. So please keep their families in your prayers this evening. We are seeing more improvements in our hospitals continue. So uh, tonight we're reporting 182 patients with COVID-19 in local hospitals. Uh, that continues the downward trend. There are 29 new admissions in the last 24 hours, 72 patients in the ICU and 40 are on ventilators. Again, the numbers are continuing to move in the right direction and our vaccine numbers continue to go up, but we are not there yet. So please do not let your guard down as our community continues to get vaccines out. Uh, it is Tuesday, and we would normally review our school indicators today. The, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is now providing schools, including those in Bear County, however, with the tools, indicators, and other guidance to support open and safe schools while still recognizing that COVID-19 presents an ongoing public health threat. With that said, effective today, March 23rd, 2021, all health directives issued by the Bear County Public Health Authority related to school systems are now withdrawn, and we will no longer be compiling or reporting our own school data indicators, instead of pointing to that very good CDC guidance that is made available every day. And that will be consistent uh, across the board. And uh, quickly on vaccines now, as of yesterday in Bear County, we have 421,411 people who have been received their first dose and a full 233,463 people who are fully vaccinated in our, in our community. So let's continue to wear our masks and social distance as we work to get more people vaccinated. Briefly on, um, with regard to the Texas Department of State Health Services announcement today, all adults will be eligible to receive a COVID-19 vaccine starting next Monday, March 29th. The state has also directed vaccine providers to prioritize people who are 80 years or older when scheduling appointments and accommodate anyone in that age group who presents va for vaccination whether or not they have an appointment by immediately moving them to the front of the line. This will ensure vaccination of anyone 80 and up to receive access as quickly as possible, which is something that we all need to protect the most vulnerable among us. So starting on Monday, the Alamo Dome encourages those who are 80 and over to visit the Alamo Dome Monday through Saturday in the afternoon to receive their vaccines. No appointment will be required for those 80 years of age or over. Let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, that's uh, March 29th, uh, Monday, I guess, that that starts. Uh, I know out at the University Hospital, uh, this week we're doing teachers and all school personnel. It's running it probably going to run about 3,000 or so a day. And we think we'll be through with all of it by Monday. It's possible we would, might still have some to do Monday, uh, but um, we'll be gearing up and kind of getting our notice in place by the end of the week about how we will handle it. Obviously, uh, we will be taking the senior adults that are 
80 or we may even drop to 75, somewhere in that range, and uh, giving them priority. And then uh, uh, we'll have to see how we fold in everything else and what the, um, well, again, how many vaccines we have, too, to be able to give. So uh, uh, we'll be getting geared up for it and have some announcement later on this week about how we'll handle it. Thank you, Judge. A lot of changes happening in the vaccine administration process nationally. We'll keep you apprised as how that moves into our community. And, of course, we still want more vaccines to go along with it. I do want to remind you, if you're struggling to pay rent or mortgage through this pandemic, there is help available for you. Our emergency housing assistance program is taking applications, and you can get more information by calling 311 also, if you're out of work without an income and have been affected by this pandemic in that way, we do have a training program available for you and where you can train for jobs that are available in our community today to be conducted. Safely. All right, as we thought, a lot of talk about the fact that on Monday, the state of Texas has said all adults can get vaccinated. Uh, you heard the mayor there talking about uh, the fact that right now more than 421,000 people have their first vaccine, 233,463 fully vaccinated. But the thing I took out of that is the state is asking vaccine providers to prioritize people 80 and over. So the mayor is saying on Monday, anyone 80 and over can come by the Alamo Dome in the afternoons and receive a shot. No appointment is necessary if you are 80 or over. Yeah, and that's something uh, important to reiterate that 80 years and older does not have to have an appointment to get that priority. A couple of noteworthy things, uh, even in addition to that, outside of the numbers as well, the mayor saying today, normally we talk about uh, school risk indicators on Tuesdays, but he was saying that because of the CDC guidance that is now out directing schools on what measures they should take for COVID-19, uh, he was saying effective today, all public health directives relating to schools issued by Metro Health have now been rescinded. Essentially, Metro Health is not going to be issuing any guidance on that. They're going to be looking to the CDC. All right, let's turn over to weather right now and talk about what a beautiful Tuesday this is. And I don't know if the did the rain just kind of clear things out. I mean, it just felt like it was a fresh day. <laughs> it essentially did because of the wind behind it. North okay. wind. So we got rid of the humidity just for today. It'll be back tomorrow and it feels more crisp outside. But I do want to point out that last night it got very severe for a brief time here around Canyon Lake. Take a look at this. The National Weather Service just did a storm survey earlier today. Paul Ura and his crew up there out of New Braunfels and they scoped out this site on the south side of Canyon Lake near boat launch boat ramp number six, and that's where we have a confirmed EF1 tornado with a path length of just under a half mile and the maximum width of about 250 yards estimated maximum wind speed of up to 100 miles per hour. That was last night. Tomorrow we start the day cloudy by the afternoon. We'll have a little bit of sunshine. A few sprinkles here and there, a few hit or miss showers possible, but it's tomorrow night when we could see more widespread activity on the radar screen and even some thunderstorms. Notice 11 p.m. Hill Country, Edwards Plateau, some activity developing midnight 1, 2 a.m., mainly west of I-35, and some of these could even become strong to severe. There's the off chance of that as well, particularly in the Hill Country tomorrow night into the early morning hours on Thursday. And even some of these showers could work their way closer to San Antonio as we get into the morning commute on your Thursday. Then we clear out again and it's going to sweep away the humidity. 81 now dew point at 24. So relative humidity of 12%, not even a breeze, calm wind near 90 in Catula, 88 Laredo. We're 86 in Del Rio. New Braunfels now at 80. Temperatures falling down just through the 70s and 60s this evening. Clear sky, comfortable out there, gentle breeze. But tomorrow, first thing in the morning, you'll notice the humidity. Fog as well and some patchy sprinkles. So a bit of dampness to start the day and a few hit or miss light showers during the day. But the rain chances, as I mentioned before, they really increase tomorrow night on into the early morning hours on Thursday. 80 tomorrow, upper 70s on Thursday becoming sunny. Friday and Saturday looking and feeling good. 84, not too humid. Palm Sunday, can't rule out a few showers, but right now just a slight chance. Okay, thanks Adam. All right, one of the things you love about the Spurs, just how involved in the community they are and 
you know, I'd like to say they wore that on their sleeves last <laughs> night, but they, they actually had jerseys on. A little so. bit more than that. And Patty had to go the extra mile because he wore his wife's, who he had to get out of the frame at their home in Hawaii and uh, have it overnighted all the way here. And it almost didn't make it. When we come back, we'll show you how the Spurs paid tribute to the women's national basketball tournament here in San Antonio and a very controversial ending in one of those games coming up. Going three and two on their grueling five games in seven days road trip. The Spurs return to the AT&T Center to get an historic nine-game homestand in 15 days, the longest homestand in franchise history. But it did not start out the way they wanted. The Spurs are down 10 points at the end of the first quarter, another 10 at the half, only to fight their way back against the Charlotte Hornets in the fourth quarter behind Derek White's 21 points, including this lay-in that gives the Spurs their first lead since the first quarter, 76-74. And then DeMar DeRozan gets the basket and the foul with the three. Free throw, by the way, he ties the game at 93. He would lead the Spurs with 28, but it was not enough as the Spurs fall with the Hornets 197. That drops the Spurs below 500 at home, 10 and 11. While on the road, they're 12 and 7. As fans return, will home court advantage return as well for the Spurs? It'll definitely help a little bit. I mean, honestly, not as much as if it was sold out and everything, but um, just having that little bit of extra support, um, I think it will definitely help a little bit get that little home court feel back. Now, before last night's tip-off, the Spurs honored women of basketball since the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament is being hosted right here in the Alamo City. DeJounte Murray donning Becky Hammond's Colorado State jersey. DeMar DeRozan honoring Hall of Famer Cheryl Miller. Rudy Gay paying tribute to Rebecca Lobo. But Patty Mills shows to honor his wife, Alyssa, who played her college ball at St. Mary's in California. Yeah, really cool. Um, it was a good little touch, um, obviously, with the women's uh, NCAA March Madness here in San Antonio. So for us to show support to, um, you know, women's sport and, and do it in a, in a cool way. And for me to add a, a personal touch to it, um, it, it was really cool. Um, yeah, really enjoyed that. <laughs> Glad it arrived on time. Here's the matchup next up. The Clippers in the first game of back-to-backs against the Spurs tomorrow night, 7.30. The fight, Texas Aggies women's basketball team avoided an early upset in the first round of the NCAA women's basketball tournament by holding off 15 seeded Troy last night. Ironically, the second seeded Aggies found themselves fighting for their basketball lives on the home court of the Texas Longhorns of the Frank Irwin Center. Aaliyah Wilson's layup gave A&M their lead, 79-77, with just over a minute left. But this game did not end without controversy. With just four seconds left, it appears the Aggies go over and back on the inbound and no call. Troy is furious, but after the game, the official explanation is that Des Destiny Pitts did not have possession of the ball until she was in the backcourt, and the Aggies avoid the upset 84-80. In live action, I didn't know if we had control of it. I think that's what why she didn't call it. But I cannot say for sure. You've watched the film and the replay. If she did have control of it, it was over back. If she didn't have control of it, it was a good call. There you go. The Aggies next face, number seven, Iowa State, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in the Alamo Dome, South Court. Meantime, the six-seeded Texas Longhorns have advanced to the second round, where they will face third-seeded UCLA tomorrow at 8 in the Alamo Dome. It's after they beat 11-seeded Bradley, 81-62, at the University Advance Center in San Marcos. The Horns were led by Charlie Collier, who scored 23 points and hauled in 15 rebounds, but was a target of some unwanted, overrated chance in the fourth quarter. That's about as classless as any adult could be that's, that's going to do that to a kid, to a young person playing. A kid. This, these aren't pros. You ain't paying $100 to come into these games. So standing up there and chanting that, that was as classless as the, what I heard in our semifinal game in the Big 12 tournament. Yeah, you have to just remember the kids at this level. They're yeah. not pros. They're not getting paid to be out there. They're doing it because they love it, and they're doing it for their school. I agree yeah. wholeheartedly with you and Texas coach. There you go. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Our KSAT Q&A is up next. It is a group that was founded in 1913. More than 100 years later, it is still a problem in the United States. We are talking about the Anti-Defamation League, fighting hate and bigotry. Mark Tobin joins us now. He is the uh, Anti-Defamation League Southwest Regional Director. Used to live in San Antonio. Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. First off, 
What is the Anti-Defamation League and what do they do? I mean, like I said, I know you fight hatred, you fight bigotry, right. but you also have do studies. You also uh, find if there's something that's that's occurring more and where it's occurring than other places. That's right. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's it's good to be home, uh, so to speak. Uh, so the Anti-Defamation League, as you uh, said, was founded in 1913 uh, with a dual mission. Uh, which was to stop the defamation of the Jewish people, uh, but also to secure justice and fair treatment for all. Uh, we understand uh, that, that Jews and all people uh, who suffer bigotry uh, and racism and injustice are only as safe as any one group that might be subject to that, to that hate. Um, we do that in a number of ways. Certainly education is at the forefront of what we do. Uh, but everything that we uh, work on in the education that we produce, uh, the initiatives that we seek, it's all based on data. We need to understand where the hate is, what kind of hate it is, who it is directed to. Uh, so we are extraordinarily data-driven uh, in our strategy so that we can figure out how to address uh, whether it's hate, racism, bigotry, anti-Semitism um, that is coming from uh, places around the country. And part of that data plays right into a study that your organization recently did looking at the rise of white supremacist propaganda in the U.S. Tell us a little bit about the purpose of that study, the scope and really the findings. Yeah, so we, as I mentioned, uh, drill down on data in a number of areas every year. And one of those is to understand uh, white supremacist propaganda. And typically this occurs whether through leafleting or through uh, some kinds of uh, ad hoc uh, kinds of um, propaganda uh, events um, or things like banner drops where perhaps they might drop a banner from a bridge over a freeway. And we've been monitoring this for for, for many, many years. Um, and for example, in 2015, both in Texas and in the country, in 2015 and 16, we found zero, zero number of white supremacist propaganda events. In 17, we saw some. In Texas, there was 17, and around the country, 428. Uh, 2019, 260 in Texas, and a little over 2,700 in the country. In 2020, around the country, 5,125 episodes of white supremacist propaganda, and of those, 574 were in Texas, unfortunately, to, re to lead the nation. That's a doubling of what you've seen so far. Is there is there one particular group, when we talk about Texas and we zero in on Texas, is there one particular group that you were looking at at the ADL who you believe is responsible for most of this propaganda? Yeah, well, first of all, there are about three groups that make up, uh, I believe it's about 90% of it. That's the Patriot Front, uh, this New Jersey European Heritage Association, and then the National Socialist Club. Uh, the, the first, uh, the Patriot Front and the National Socialist Club have been particularly involved in Texas and in San Antonio, but of this large number, the Patriot Front uh, is responsible for about 80%, over 4,000 of the episodes of the 5,000 plus episodes have been uh, the responsibility of the Patriot Front. Uh, the Patriot Front um, is a white supremacist based organization. Uh, and they, let me say that, first of all, they're, they're not patriots um, and they are only a front for, for racism and for bigotry and for, for spewing hate uh, and divisiveness amongst our country. So given what you found in that study, those disheartening numbers, uh, especially when it comes to what's coming out of the state of Texas, now we're looking at a rise in crimes, hate crimes, hate directed toward Asians, Asian Americans. Does that seem at all a surprise to you, given the rise in that kind of propaganda? You know, unfortunately, uh, no. Uh, you know, the... The anti-Asian hate uh, really started, you know, when the pandemic started in earnest, when a lot of people, you know, had to start working remotely. Uh, and that's when I first recall is hearing about it. 
Uh, and it is, you know, bad enough that people had to deal with the effects of the pandemic, whether it is trying to stay safe or fighting the illness itself or, you know, being a healthcare worker or losing a job and, and the economics of the pandemic. But then uh, to also have to deal with discrimination and hate uh, that was propagated at the highest levels of our government uh, from the White House by using derogatory terms in order to call attention to the pandemic. So instead of being helpful, it actually made things worse for a number of people. And it played into this narrative that many of the white supremacist groups were already uh, pushing out through the propaganda, uh, whether it was the leafleting that we just talked about, or in particular through the online hate, which is an enormous problem uh, and something that we've been working uh, to resolve uh, because so much of the hate and so much of the connectivity between extremists happens online. Mark Tubin with the Anti-Defamation League. Mark, uh, we're out of time, but quickly, if somebody wants to know how they can help in the effort to fight hate, to fight bigotry, I think shining a light on it is one way, and that's what I hope we're doing today. Uh, yeah. But it, there are tips on your website as well, correct? Yes, absolutely. So first of all, please uh, visit www.adl.org. And one thing is, um, if you do experience hate or discrimination or see it, please report it. So it's if you visit our website, there's a report incident uh, uh, opportunity. Please report it. So that way we understand uh, what what's happening. But it's more so there. The responsibility is incumbent upon every single person not to accept uh, the the words that lead to the kind of violence that we've seen, particularly among um, people of, of AAPI origin. Uh, it, it's, it's something that everybody's gonna have to take responsibility for, uh, not just uh, obviously our leaders, but, but every single person from our educators to our parents, to leaders at the local state or level. And by the way, I just wanna mention that uh, the San Antonio City Council led by the mayor they were the first in the nation to pass an anti-hate COVID resolution, which became the model for the entire country. Uh, it was a model that we put out and they were the first to pass it uh, and indicated that San Antonio will not stand up uh, to, will, will stand against uh, the kind of hate that is being uh, propagated. Mark Tobin, Anti-Defamation League, again, thank you so much for your time. We'll be right back. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Here at home, the blood supply in San Antonio and our surrounding area at a critical low. Mayor Ron Nuremberg stressed the issue in last night's daily briefing. Sarah Acosta spoke with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center about this need during a blood drive at Antonian College Preparatory High School this morning. This is two-year-old Amy, who was recently diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia. She is in need of a lot of blood treatments and the reason behind the blood drive at the Antonian College Preparatory High School today. Amy is one of, of thousands right now, obviously, that, you know, it's very sad in our community of people that have cancer and need platelets, plasma, or whole blood. The drive coming in at a critical time. Francine Pina with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says the need for blood in our community is dire and is struggling every day to keep up with demand. They especially need type O blood. We're giving out a hundred more units on a daily basis than we're actually receiving. And the only solution for that is for us to be able to rely on our community support. And that's why blood drives just like today's at Antonian is so important. Christy Crawcraft with the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center says the reason for the shortage is because they haven't been able to schedule as many blood drives during the pandemic. We are having to find any way and every way to get our community to respond without going on to an appeal and really get our community to schedule an appointment, show up and be there. Today's drive goes until 2 p.m. Appointments are required, but there are still some spaces available. All you have to do is call this number 210-731-5590. From Antonia, I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. A loud storm that rolled through our area last night. Yeah, woke a lot of people up, and then today, 
lot warmer out there. Yeah, yeah beautiful out. Did some today. damage out there too. It did. Canyon Lake area, yeah. south side of Canyon Lake, closer to boat ramp uh, six, I believe. That launch. That's where we had an EF1 tornado briefly touch down there. So they had some damage. Bernie had some large hail as well. We also got some decent rainfall in spots. Take a look at this. You, you see the different, basically sections of the aquifer and where we really like the rain is in that purple recharge zone in the middle and even in the drainage zone, which is that more of a red kind of a pink color. And you look at the radar and we did get some decent rainfall in those zones where we want it. We picked up about four tenths of an inch at the airport in San Antonio, but some higher accumulations as you get up into the hill country. So it was nice to see some rain where it was needed, at least particularly how the aquifer is concerned. So it is up a little bit today. It's up four tenths of a foot, but we're still about nine and a half feet below the March average. So we're still struggling and need some more rainfall. Here's the big swirl in the atmosphere, the storm system that's moving out of here. It's got a lot of precipitation still with it. It's just moving away. Another system on its heels. This has been a pattern over the past few weeks with these systems dropping into the southwestern US and bringing some mountain snowfall, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and then it moves into Texas and brings us some areas of rain. I do think this one will have a little better push of energy, particularly over the hill country tomorrow night. So let's look at our future cast. The clouds fill in again early tomorrow morning. So you'll wake up to the gray, somewhat damp and especially sticky conditions. So the humidity is back in place, gray, low clouds, fog, and a few sprinkles. Just going to be one of those mornings. By the afternoon, we'll squeeze in a little bit of sunshine. Can't rule out a rogue, rogue shower or two. Then we get into tomorrow night. Notice 11 p.m. Maybe some activity developing Edwards Plateau, parts of the hill country. Midnight, 1, 2 a.m. A little more scattered out there, especially west of I-35. And that's where we could have some isolated severe weather. There's this, the off chance of that, particularly in the hill country. And then the leftovers of that activity slowly pushing east towards San Antonio by about the morning commute on Wednesday. So we started today at 51, topped out at 83. Again, almost four tenths of an inch of rain out there from the storms overnight. 81 right now, dew point at 24. And you notice in the... Sky cam here. It's a little dusty outside. We noticed a little extra haze. We think that's some dust that's in the air that blew in from West Texas yesterday. Dew points are down. Dry air in place. This changes tomorrow. Notice how Corpus Christi is a dew point of 61. That humid air is going to be coming our way gradually tonight from the Gulf of Mexico, and you'll notice it tomorrow. We're at 83 now in Kennedy, 76 in Kerrville, 82 in Hondo. And you get a little closer look here, Castroville, Hondo, Divine area, lower 80s at this hour, and Helotus now at 82. So this evening, comfortable. You don't need a jacket. Temperatures falling gradually through the 70s, then the 60s. Notice 10 p.m., 67, low humidity, and then increasing clouds after midnight, leading to some areas of fog, a few patchy sprinkles out there. So some dampness to start the day and reduce visibility for the morning commute. Then we'll squeeze in some afternoon sunshine. So that off chance of a rogue shower here and there. 80 degrees, the high temperature, southeasterly breeze, 5 to 10, not all that noticeable. And tomorrow night, some scattered storms developing. Again, the slight chance of a few severe storms, especially in the hill country. And some of that could linger into the morning commute around San Antonio on Thursday. Then during the day Thursday, we actually clear out nicely. We'll have a lot of sunshine, upper 70s, a comfortable day. We'll be in the mid 80s by Friday and Saturday with a good amount of sunshine. But this weekend, the humidity is back. You're going to notice that this weekend, and it's that time of year where it becomes more common for it to stick around. Mm. Ah, lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I thought you'd love that, Myra. Yeah, <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. And a good morning to you. It is Tuesday, March 23rd. Happy Tuesday. Thank you for starting your morning with us. According to ABC News, HHS is asking to house unaccompanied minors at two bases in the state of Texas, here at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland and on post at Fort Bliss in El Paso. Right now, it's unclear how many minors would be housed at each facility. Images of children in a crowded holding facility and laying on the floor are no doubt disturbing. But I would say that it's better than them being on the street in Matamoros or Reynosa. Or go back to the countries they fled that she says are just as dangerous. Meantime, some big news for Texans starting March 29th. That's Monday. 
all adult Texans will be eligible to get vaccinated. That means anyone 18 or older can schedule an appointment to get the Moderna or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And we begin with late breaking news on the south side. Police say a woman was slashed in the throat. Police say friends were gathered at a home on Ludkey Avenue when a man said that he needed a ride home. A woman believed to be in her 50s offered him that ride. And during that trip, police say they allegedly got into some kind of argument, leading him to slice her throat, though it's unclear with what. She tells police the man then took off on foot and she drove back to that home where someone called 911. Police say her injury may be life threatening and she was taken to a hospital. That suspect is still on the loose. Another look at that forecast here tomorrow. Humid day. It'll be sticky and muggy. A fair amount of cloud cover as well. 54 in the morning, then near 80 in the afternoon. We get into uh, tomorrow night, and that's when we have a better chance of a few more storms popping up, especially in the hill country and some locations west of I-35. Otherwise, just a little damp in the morning tomorrow with fog and sprinkles, but sunny Thursday afternoon all the way into Saturday. All right. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at 10.